so if this is where you're going to be level, and then you're going to be the synopsis, and then you're going to be reading Pilgrim's Progress. Hope you enjoy. Make sure like, button, subscribe to this video, and Twilight's up in her perch. That's when I know it's time to give Dad the seat. What's the synopsis? I said synopsis. Here you go, Dad. I still don't know exactly what happens during the seat. intro. But here I've got my little... He's right in front of me. It doesn't really work. Alright, so it's nice. Alright, so we're reading Exodus chapter 26. And this is the English Standard Version. We're going to learn all about the tabernacle today. And let me begin. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet yarns. You shall make them with cherubim skillfully worked into them. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits and the breadth of each curtain four cubits. All the curtains shall be the same size. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another, and the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. And you shall make loops of blue on the edge of the outermost curtain in the first set. Likewise, you shall make loops on the edge of the outermost curtain in the second set. Fifty loops you shall make on the one curtain, and fifty loops you shall make on the edge of the curtain that is in the second set. The loops shall be opposite one another, and you shall make fifty clasps of, clasps of gold, and couple the curtains one to the other with the clasps, so that the tabernacle may be single, may be a single whole. <laughs> You shall also make, the, make curtains of goat's hair for the tent over the tabernacle. Eleven curtains shall you make. The length of each curtain shall be thirty cubits, and the breadth of each curtain four cubits. The eleven curtains shall be the same size. You shall couple five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves, and the sixth curtain you shall double over at the front of the tent. You shall make fifty loops on the edge of the curtain that is that is outermost in one set, and fifty loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in the second set. You shall make fifty clasps of bronze, and put the clasps into the loops, and couple the tent together, that it may be a single whole. And, that, and the part that remains of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remains, shall hang over the back of the tabernacle, and the extra that remains in the length of the curtains, the cubit on the one side and the cubit on the other side, shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle, on this side and that side, to cover it. And you shall make for the tent a covering of tanned ram skins and a covering of goat skins on top. You shall make upright frames for the tabernacle of acacia wood. Ten cubits shall be the length of a frame, and a cubit and a half the breadth of each frame. There shall be two tenons in each frame for fitting together, so that you do for all the frames of the tabernacle. So shall you do for all the frames of the tabernacle. You shall make the frames for the tabernacle, 24 frames, excuse me, I don't know where I got that, 20 frames for the south side, and 40 bases of silver you shall make under the 20 frames, two bases under one frame for its two tenons, and two bases under the next frame for its two tenons, and for the second side of the tabernacle on the north side, 20 frames, and their 40 bases of silver, two bases under one frame, and two bases <coughs> under the next frame. And for the rear of the tabernacle westward, you shall make six frames and you shall make two frames for corners of the tabernacle in the rear. They shall be separate beneath but joined at the top at the first ring. Thus shall it be with both of them. They shall form the two corners, and there shall be eight frames with their bases of silver, sixteen bases, two bases under one frame, and two bases under another frame. You shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the frames of the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames of the side of the tabernacle at the rear westward. 
The middle bar halfway up the frames shall run from end to end. You shall overlay the frames with gold and shall make their rings of gold for holders for the bars, and you shall overlay the bars with gold. Then you shall erect the tabernacle according to the plan for it that you were shown on the mountain. And you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it, and you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate you for the holy place from the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. And you shall set the, the table outside the veil and the lampstand on the south side of the tabernacle opposite the table and you shall put the table on the north side you shall make a screen for the entrance of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen embroidered with needlework and you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia and overlay them with gold their hooks shall be of gold and you shall cast five bases of bronze for them. I will just say, and I'm not going to look it up because I would spend a lot of time um, kind of just browsing, but that uh, veil that they just mentioned in verse 31 through verse 36 is the same veil if you read the New Testament. It's not, I don't know if it's the exact same veil because it was obviously the temple uh, in the New Testament times, not the tabernacle. So, but the temple. Um, the layout and the build, the construction of the temple was based on the same ideas of the tabernacle. And um, so um, the veil ripped from top to bottom right when Jesus died. Isn't that interesting? The veil that separates um, people from the most holy place where God himself dwells on the Ark of the Testimony. Of course, the Ark of the Testimony wasn't in the temple at that time, um, but it is a very interesting thing. All right, so we are um, reading The Pilgrim's Progress. We're on chapter, we read chapter 24 last time, which was all about Vanity Fair, which was a marvelous place. Let me just tell you, the people there are so good. Um, in fact, um, Christian and faith, it was Christian and faithful. Yeah. Were when they were going through vanity fair, they were actually the worst ones in the whole town. And, um, because, because, um, all the other people, they just, they just, um, banded together and thought of other people before they thought of themselves. And so it just always, you know, it was like a really cheery place and when Christian and faithful, they actually brought the cheerfulness down when they, when they walked through the town. Okay, here's Kimberly to say how it really happened. Oh my gosh. So, what actually happened was, it turns out, um, I forget what they're calling uh, him now in the book. It was like a, I forget what they call him. It, the, Christian no, Pilgrim? Pilgrim? The Prince of Darkness? Apollyon? Yeah, Apollyon. And, um, and Apollyon, he's like, you know what? All the pilgrims are crossing through here. Let's make, let's make this a really big fair where we sell everything that could pos they could possibly want. And let's try to get them trapped there. And then they'll stop pilgriming, and they'll just live there. So this fair has literally been running for thousands of years. And um, when Christian and Faithful get in, they, they're they like, Oh my gosh, these people are so crazy. And um, they they didn't like it. And somebody, somebody said, hey, do you want to buy anything? And Christian said, yeah, the truth. Oh. <laughs> and um, so they got, they got put in cages and they got 
like tortured and paraded through the streets saying, these people are crazy. They're, look at how insane they are, you know. And so um, they remembered what Evangelist had said, and um, they each hoped that they were the one who would end their journey there, but they would be willing to continue their journey if they weren't. And sorry, my hair is a complete wreck today. I have not had time to fix it. <laughs> I'm going to hand it off to Dad, who's going to read us a story. Hello again, my faithful friends. Okay, so we're back and also front. And now we're on chapter 25. And this is chapter 25, Trial of Faithful, Defense, and Death. So let's see what this one's about. Then a convenient time being appointed, they brought them forth to their trial in order to their condemnation. When the time was come, they were brought before the enemies and arraigned. The judge's name was Lord Hate Good. Their indictment was one and the same in substance, though somewhat varying in form. The contents whereof was this that they were enemies to and disturbers of the trade, that they had made commotions and divisions in the town and had won a party to their own most dangerous opinions in contempt of the law of their prince. Then Faithful began to answer that he had only set himself against that which had set itself against him, that is higher than the highest. And, said he, as for disturbance, I make none, being myself a man of peace. The parties that were won to us were won by beholding our truth and innocence, and they are only turned from the worse to the better. And as to the king you talk of, since he is Beelzebub, the enemy of our Lord, I defy him and all his angels. Then proclamation was made that they that had ought to say for their lord the king against the prisoner at the bar should forthwith appear and give in their evidence. So there came in three witnesses to wit envy, superstition, and pick thank. They were then asked if they knew the prisoner at the bar and what they had to say for their lord the king against him. Then stood forth envy and said to this effect, My lord, I have known this man a long time and will attest upon my oath before this honorable bench that he is judge. Hold, give him his oath. So they swear him. Then he said, My lord, this man, notwithstanding his plausible name, is one of the, the vilest men in our country. He neither regardeth prince nor people, law nor custom, but doeth all that he can to possess all men with certain of his disloyal notions, which he in all, excuse me, which he in the general calls principles and of faith and holiness, and in particular, I heard him once myself affirm that Christianity and the customs of our town of vanity were diametrically opposite and could not be reconciled, by which saying, my lord, he doth at once not only condemn all our laudable doings, but us in the doing of them. Then did the judge say to him, hast thou any more to say? Envy. My lord, I could say much more, only I would not be tedious to the court. Yet, if need be, when the other gentlemen have given their evidence, rather than anything shall be wanting that will dispatch him, I will enlarge my testimony against him. So he was bid to stand by. Then they called superstition and bid him look upon the prisoner. They also asked what he could say for their lord the king against him. Then they swear him, so he began superstition. My lord, I have no great acquaintance with this man, nor do I desire to have further knowledge of him. However, this I know, that he is a very pestilent fellow from such from some discourse that I had with him the other day in this town, for then, talking with him, I heard him say that our religion was not, and such by which a man could by no means please God. 
which saying of his, my lord, your lordship, very well knows that necessarily thence will follow, to wit, that we still do worship in vain, yet, uh, yet in our sins, and finally shall be darned, and this is that which I have to say. Then was Pickthank sworn, and bid say what he knew in the behalf of their lord the king against the prisoner at the bar. Pickthank, my lord and you gentlemen, all this fellow I have known of a long time, and have heard him speak things that ought not to be spoken, for he hath railed on our noble prince Beelzebub, and hath spoken contemptibly of his honorable friends, whose names are the Lord Old Man, the Lord Carnal Delight, the Lord Luxurious, the Lord Desire of Vain Glory, my old Lord Lechery, Sir Having Greeting, with all the rest of our nobility, and he hath said, moreover, that if all men were of his mind, if possible, there is not one of these noblemen should have any longer a being in this town. Besides, he hath not been afraid to rail on you, my lord, who are now appointed to be his judge, calling you an ungodly villain, with many other such like vilifying terms, with which he hath bespattered most of the gentry of our town. When this pickthank had told his tale, the judge directed his speech to the prisoner at the bar, saying, Thou run runagate, heretic, and traitor, hast thou heard what these honest gentlemen have witnessed against thee? Faithful, may I speak a few words in my own defense? Judge, Sirrah, Sirrah, thou deservest to live no longer, but to be slain immediately upon the place, yet that all men may see our gentleness toward thee, let us hear what thou, vile runagate, hast to say, faithful. Number one. I say then, in answer to what Mr. Envy has spoken, I never said aught but this, that what rule or laws or custom or people were flat against the word of God are diametrically opposed to Christianity. If I have said amiss in this, convenience me of my error, and I am ready here before you to make my recantation. Number two. As to the second, to wit, Mr. Superstition, and his charge against me, I said only this, that in the worship of God there is required a divine faith, but there can be no divine faith without a divine revelation of the will of God. Therefore, whatever is thrust into the worship of God that is not agreeable to divine revelation cannot be done but by a human faith, which faith will not be profitable to eternal life. Number three. As to what Mr. Pickthank hath said, I say, avoiding terms, as that I am said to rail and the like, that the prince of this town, with all the rabblement his attendants, led this gentleman named, are more fit for a being in hell than in this town and country, and so the Lord have mercy upon me. Then the judge called to the jury, who all this while stood by to hear and observe, Gentlemen of the jury, you see this man about whom so great an uproar hath been made in this town. You have also heard that these worthy gentlemen have witnessed against him. Also you have heard his reply and confession. It lieth now in your breasts to hang him or save his life. But yet I think meet to instruct you in our law. There was an act made in the days of Pharaoh the Great, servant to our prince, that lest those of the contrary religion should multiply and grow too strong for him, their males should be thrown into the river. There was also an act made in the days of Nebuchadnezzar the Great, another of his servants, that whoever would not fall down and worship his golden image should be thrown into a fiery furnace, 
There was also an act made in the days of Darius, that whoso for some time called upon any god but him should be cast into the lion's den. Now the substance of these laws this rebel has broken, not only in thought which is not to be borne, but also in word and deed which must therefore needs be intolerable. For that of Pharaoh, his law was made upon a supp supposition to prevent mischief, no crime being yet apparent. But here is a crime apparent. For the second and third, you see, he disputeth against our religion, and for the treason that he hath already confessed, he deserveth to die the death. Then went the jury out, whose names were Mr. Blindman, Mr. No Good, Mr. Malice, Mr. Lovelust, Mr. Liveloose, Mr. Hetty, Mr. High Mind, Mr. Enmity, Mr. Liar, Mr. Cruelty, Mr. Hate Light, and Mr. Implacable, who every one gave in his private verdict against him among themselves and afterward unanimously concluded to bring him in guilty before the judge. And first among themselves, Mr. Blindman, the foreman, said, I see clearly that this man is a heretic. Then said Mr. No Good, Away with such fellow from the earth. I, said Mr. Malice, for I hate the very looks of him. Then said Mr. Lovelust, I could never endure him. Nor I, said Mr. Liveloose, for he would always be condemning my way. Hang him, hang him, said Mr. Hetty. A sorry scrub, said Mr. High Mind. My heart riseth against him, said Mr. Enmity. He is a rogue, said Mr. Liar. Hanging is too good for him, said Mr. Cruelty. Let us dispatch him out of the way, said Mr. Hate Light. Then said Mr. Implacable, might I have all the world given to me? I could not be reconciled to him. Therefore, let us forthwith bring him in guilty of death. And so they did. Therefore, he was presently condemned to be had from the place where he was to the place from whence he came, and there to be put to the most cruel death that could be invented. They therefore brought him out to do with him according to their law, and first they scourged him, then they buffeted him, then they lanced his flesh flesh with knives. After that they stoned him with stones, then prickled him with their swords, and last, excuse me, pricked, I don't have trouble reading sometimes, pricked him with their swords, and last of all, they burned him to ashes at the stake. Thus came faithful to his end. Now I saw that there stood behind the multitude a chariot and a couple of horses waiting for faithful, who so soon as his adversaries had dispatched him, was taken up into it, and straightway was carried up through the clouds with sound of trumpet the nearest way to the celestial gate. Brave faithful, bravely done in word and deed, judge, witnesses, and jury have instead of overcoming thee, but shown their rage, and they are dead. Thou wilt live from age to age." That is the end of Faithful and also the end of <laughs> chapter 25. So next time we will pick up on chapter 26. That will be either tomorrow or Monday. And it's not my choice um, which one it is. But I will do whatever is biddest me. So... Goodbye. Have a super day. Um, Granny Bear says, Vanity Fair catered to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Yes, which is actually, um, I know it from Mark chapter, I think it's two, no, four, Mark chapter four. Um, I'll have to look up the verse exactly. Um which is uh, the parable that Jesus says of the um, the seed that is uh, spread out into the... And the parable of there's, the sower? No. Um, the, when Jesus spreads the seeds out <coughs> to the different ground and some of the seed sprouts up and dies quickly and some of the seed... Um, anyway, the fourth one is the good seed that... 
Um, it lands on the good fertile soil. Um, but the third one is the, um, it represents um, the seed that lands in the, just like Granny Bear said, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So, um, I know that that's also repeated, that, that um, trilogy of things is repeated several times, and you could actually probably um, put just about any sin in one of those three categories. So, that is pretty much what that is talking about. So, all right, hooray, faithful. Yes, he got to have a good end and went to the celestial city ahead of Christian, who now has to um, endure the rest of his time on his own. So God bless you. Have a great night. We'll see you again next time. Thank you. Bye.